Hello all, I hope you're doing well. There we go. Um, I hope all's going well for you and yours and all that. Um, today, we're going to talk about marginal productivity, marginal cost, or as I always like to say, marginal this and marginal that. And um, yeah, shouldn't make fun. This is half, basically half of orthodox economics. Um, it's really something, I mean, orthodox economics, as I've said before, is a wonderfully um, concise system. You just have to know a few things. Um, the most, probably the single most important thing to know is to always think along the margin, um, which means forgetting about everything inframarginal, everything except the last thing you're doing. Because everything, you know, the logic is everything that you've done up until then is kind of irrelevant to your decision now. You make your decision now based on the situation now. And that's, that's actually often a really good way to think. Um, we often get caught up as people um, in our history, and that's not where you want to be. You, want, you do want to think about your situation now in terms of what's happening now. Don't hold grudges. Um, in game theory, which is something that you'll learn about um, if you pursue economics, or maybe if you go into business, um, business planning, um, maybe a little bit of political thinking. Um, you know, there's a theorem um, that the best strategy to follow um, is one that bears no grudges, but responds to what people do to you most recently. Um, so if somebody was mean to you last week, but is nice to you now, then reward them being nice and kind of forget about the past. But if somebody was nice to you in the past and is mean to you now, yes, you do need to respond to their meanness. Um, but your response should be proportional um, and it should be focused on what's happening now. Yeah, don't bear grudges. Um, and that's a bit of the logic behind ne orthodox economists, neoclassical economists focus on the margin. Um, don't bear grudges. Yeah, sure, you made a lot of, you know, a lot of utility, a lot of happiness from that first ice cream cone, but you got to be thinking about, do you really want this fourth ice cream cone? The first beer was wonderful, but do you really want the fifth beer? You know, make your decision based on the pleasure or pain of the current circumstance. Um, now, as far as marginal productivity and marginal cost, we'll be talking about half of orthodox economics, because we'll be talking about the supply curve, the origins of the supply curve, which means how much will people or businesses supply given the particular price offered? Before, with the demand curve, we talked about how much would you buy given the price offered? Now we talk about how much will you supply given the price offered? Notice, this is all completely uh, decentralized and powerless. You are making a decision based on the price offered. You're not influencing the price. You're taking the prices given. Somebody, someplace, or some group of people, whatever, your hand wave a lot, are setting prices. And you are just making your decision on how much to produce or consume given what decisions that they've made, okay? Powerless. Um, is it a meaningful representation of reality? No, no, but it's a beautiful system. Like I said, you know, it's a really simple, concise system that gives a, a model of the economy. It's, an, it, it's a fun model. It's like chess openings and about as relevant you know, for economic policy as chess openings are to war. You know, 
it, you know, chess is a model of war, but you know, it's a pretty, you know, you, you know, if you're actually going to go to West Point or Sandhurst or, you know, some other military academy, you don't want to think, you know, try to model war and make your war plans based on, you know, how pieces move in chess. That's not the way it is. Um, and the same for economic policy. You really don't want to base your policy on neoclassical microeconomics. People do. Increasingly, over the last 50 years, people have been, and it's been a disaster. But okay, he has corduroy in his glory. Um, and down there is corduroy. There he is. Yes, yes. Um, corduroy is panting. We were outside playing for a while. He's still catching his breath, uh, but at least he came to visit. That's nice. Um, he'll be asleep soon. That's what my lectures do to him. Marginal productivity and marginal cost, the neoclassical supply curve, <laughs> and why it's wrong. Um, the why it's wrong part will be ongoing. <laughs> okay, readings, videos, quiz, discussion, problems that do. Okay. In the short run, oh, the short run, the short run when other inputs like machinery and buildings are fixed. We define the short run. The short run is tautologically the period during which you cannot change machinery and buildings. There are fixed inputs that you can't change. In the long run, by definition, there are no fixed inputs. How long is the, is the short run? Depends on the industry, maybe a couple of years. Um, automobile manufacture, um, it, it used to take like five years to bring in a new, pro, a new car line. Um, that's been shortened. Um, you know, now, you know, the companies are more nimble, nimble, whatever, um, three years. Um, that's how long it takes to engineer a new car, including planning how it will be made and getting the machinery to make that car. Um, so from start to finish might be three years. Um, airliners could be a decade or more. Um, and then, you know, while they start you know, roll, rolling off the assembly line, such as it is, um, you know, they're usually still making changes. Um, to open a bakery, maybe a few months from start to finish. Um, but in the short run, when, when some inputs are fixed, how do you increase output? You can't add machinery or buildings, but you can add labor, basically labor. There are other variable inputs that you add, but we, we'll focus on labor. Um, and you'll increase output by adding more workers to a fixed building, fixed machinery, and your workers' marginal productivity, how much output the next worker gives you. That's going to be falling because the variable inputs, the labor you're adding, start to run out of stuff with which to work. That is it. That is the core idea in orthodox supply theory. It's half the idea for orthodox microeconomics. Well, so maybe not half, but close to half. You know, close to half is marginal utility, close to half is marginal productivity, and everything else is the rest. Marginal costs rise because of diminishing marginal productivity. So if you're going to increase output by adding workers to a, a fixed machinery and a fixed plant, then your workers are going to be becoming less and less productive. So to get the same increase in output, you have to add more and more workers. Because of that, you will increase supply. You will produce more donuts, more loaves of bread, more um, whatever it is you're making, only if somebody will pay you more money for them because you're going to have to, to get that extra output, you're going to have to be adding more workers. 
ever, ever more workers. In the long run, with no inputs fixed, marginal productivity is constant or increasing. You know, because you get the, um, you know, the division of labor, the stuff that Adam Smith talked about. Um, so in the long run, since the supply curve is upward sloping because of diminishing marginal productivity, if marginal productivity is not diminishing, then the supply curve will not be upward sloping. So in the long run, the supply curve is not upward sloping. It may in fact, and it usually will be, downward sloping because as you have a larger facility, you get what's called economies to scale coming from increased division of labor. So in the long run, the supply curve is downward sloping. Okay, think along the margin. These pictures are from a TV show ah, from 10, 15 years ago, Weeds. It was about um, a widow who um, discovers that they had no money when her husband died, um, but she goes into the business of growing weed back when it was illegal. Um, of course, it's now legal in California where the show was based. I think she was in Napa or something like that. Um, yeah. Rich suburban housewife suddenly has no money, starts growing weed um, with, um, with an assorted set of characters. The first two seasons were really good after that. It went down here, but it was really good for that first. Okay, how do you increase output? You're a farmer um, and you grow weed. I mean, I, God, marijuana is a big crop. No kidding. Um, the market is huge. 10 years ago, while it was still mostly illegal, it was a hundred billion dollar market in the United States, mostly imported. Um, I think we produce a lot more domestically now. Um, 50 million Americans used weed in the past year. Uh, that was in 2021. That was from like 2019 from the CDC. Um, 30 million spend $55 a week on weed. The other 20 million just use it occasionally. Um, uh, and okay, uh, some smoke too much. Not you, you guys don't smoke too much, I'm sure. Um, you only use it recreationally and help you get to sleep and help you, um, you know, tolerate boring economics lectures and help you have a comfortable social interactions. And uh, seriously, um, my wife has a friend who smokes a lot of weed. Um, her boyfriend, her living boyfriend, <laughs> smokes so much, so much. Um, you open the door to the house and smoke drifts out. It's not tobacco. You know, uh, you can smell weed from across the street. It's really really something how much some people use. Uh, Baby Yoda doesn't use weed. He eats macarons and other cookies. So cute. You grow it on your balcony. You <laughs> grow it on national forest land, which you should not. You should be paying rent to the, uh, to the public for using national forest land. And these guys, they will defend their weed with AK-47 and it's really, really dangerous. You know, people hiking in the far national parks and national forests sometimes run into a, a weed farm and get chased off with gunshots. It's not good, not good. You grow it indoors. This has become a big business in the city of Holyoke. Um, because Holyoke has cheap electricity since it has a dam on the Connecticut River, um, but it has cheap electricity and it um, uh, public electricity. Um, and they have a lot of old buildings, old warehouses and factories um, where you can, because one thing is you know, if you want to do this right, you really want to be, and you see the plastic in the background, you really want to keep control of the genes. You don't want you know, seeds floating in. Um, so you really want to keep control. You want to keep temperature control um, and you want lighting. You know, the lighting takes electricity um, and controlling the temperature and 
uh, preventing um, <laughs> volunteers, uh, you know, plants, seeds floating in from outside. Um, it's good, you know, these buildings are great. Um, you know, they now grow in weed in warehouses along, you know, in Hatfield and along the Connecticut River. Um, it's getting to be a big business, a very big business. Um, my nephew got in early, lucky him, or shrewd. Um, you know, he went to college in Colorado um, and smoked a lot of weed. Uh, <laughs> he turned it into, um, you know, he's the CFO of one of the early big uh, pot companies in Colorado, uh, doing very well. Okay. Oh, it's like the police, I mean, it's like, cut it out. You know, I mean, the Biden administration, Democrats in Congress have been trying to legalize it nationally, um, do away with these restrictions because, you know, like you can't use your credit card to buy weed. What's that? Because the weed companies can't process payments through the um, Federal Reserve System. Um, it, it's just use, it's just silly. It's like, come on. Free the weed. Um, you know, I mean, you can buy all sorts of crap. I mean, alcohol, okay. Guns. I mean, you can buy a gun that will kill people. Kill five-year-olds at an elementary school. You could buy a gun. You know, one of these giant big guns. You just walk in and kill people. Yeah, 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 I'm a Republican. I kill people. Well, whatever. Okay, anyway. Our tax dollars at work. That's just state police taking this woman's pot plants. Yep. Okay. Legal in much of the country. Still illegal in Wisconsin? What's with that? Virginia? I know that uh, the Virginia legislature voted to legalize it. I think it was vetoed by the Republican governor. So I don't know where things stand, uh, but it's legal in Massachusetts. Good for you. Grow pot, do it in your bathtub, do better in a greenhouse. Um, okay, how do you increase output? Well, you hire more workers. The new workers will weed, water your plants, feed them, prune, make sure everything's going the way it should be. And your first workers will have a lot to work with and they'll do a lot of productive work and they'll be very busy because they have a lot to work with and nobody's getting in the way. They're all by themselves. They don't have to worry about walking into anybody. Uh, if you've worked in a kitchen, you know what this is like where you start getting crowded. You, know, you don't want to step back without making sure. And yes, you, know, so, you know, being crowded slows you down, but that won't happen. But then uh, to increase output more, you okay, hire more workers. It starts not working out so well because you start getting crowded. Your new workers start being less productive because they have less, fewer plants to work with, fewer tools. They start having to wait for somebody else to walk away so they can use some tool. Um, they have to start worrying about walking into people. So they have to, they move a little more, a little slower. Um, that's uh, Mary Kate, um, uh, or else Ashley. I'm not sure she was. Um, she was one of the workers <laughs> in this in weeds. Um, okay, each worker starts being less productive. Additional workers run out of stuff with which to work, diminishing marginal productivity of labor. To get the same increase in output, you start. You need to add even more workers. Oh, and what happens when you add even more workers? You know, the first ounce you were able to hire, get one worker, paying for one worker. By the time you're further along to get one more ounce, you may need five workers. And that's going to be five times as expensive. Diminishing marginal productivity because your work, additional workers are less productive means increasing marginal cost because to get more output, you need more workers. Yeah, 
the first couple guys, no problem. You set them up on the table, they're productive. Then to get more output, you start having to add more workers who are getting in each other's way. Maybe you start running out of bandwidth. You certainly start running out of table space. Okay, you're a good manager. So you get a spreadsheet. Um, looks like Corduroy's gone to sleep and he does that without pot. Okay, good manager, you get a spreadsheet. Um, your first worker produces 10 ounces. You think, oh boy, I'm making a lot of money here. It's great, module product of 10. That means each ounce takes one tenth of a worker. If you're paying your workers $10, yeah, $10, it's a 10 minutes work, whatever. Um, then that's $1 to each ounce. The labor that goes into each of your first 10 ounces costs you $1. Let's jump all the way down to work at 10. Work at 10 um, gives you one ounce going from 54 to 55 ounces, only one ounce, which means that ounce costs $10 of labor. What has happened to the marginal cost per ounce? It's increased. Why? Because the marginal product has gone down. Marginal product and marginal cost are alternate sides of the seesaw. One goes down, the other goes up. Output rises by adding more workers, but at a diminishing rate, diminishing marginal productivity of labor because workers have less and less with which to work. Additional workers add less to your total output, meaning to get the same increase in output, you need more workers, more cost. Why does the marginal productivity of labor fall? because additional workers have less and less with which to work. Why does marginal cost rise? Because the marginal product of labor falls. I got, I've been teaching this for 40 friggin' years. And it still excites me. <laughs> oh, it's, this is great. I mean, it's like, it fits together. It's beautiful. And then, yeah, there's, look, there's a certain logic to it. I, I, I had a job in college um, uh, working in my father's business. You could, I call it a job. It wasn't really a job. I was working with my father and my brother, but I started working. I, you know, I was um, smart Alec, fresh out of, you know, your age, fresh out of freshman microeconomics. And, um, you know, I said to my brother, well, I think the marginal product of, additional people in the warehouse is still above, you know, and my friends say, shut up about marginal product and marginal cost. This is a business. <laughs> you know, we, don't, we don't use those terms, but maybe you should. I think there's something to it. Um, but I'll repeat, because regardless of whether it matters to business or whether this is a good way for businesses to think of it, there's something to it, but you know, you don't want to go too far. But regardless, for this class, this is fundamental. And for any economics class you take, either here or in business school, um, or even, you know, sometimes in the other social sciences, it's good to understand these ideas. Um, marginal cost rises because marginal product of labor falls, and only when the marginal product of labor falls. Okay, marginal cost rises because marginal product of labor falls. Why does marginal product of labor falls? Because other inputs are fixed, but they're only fixed in the short run. Remember, way back, like slide three, only fixed in the short run. Given time, you'll always build more stuff, make the warehouse bigger, make the farm bigger. No reason not to. So in the long run, marginal product of labor doesn't fall and marginal costs don't rise. Okay, short run. Additional works is less and less productive. You need to add more and more of them to get the same increase in output. So more workers for an additional ounce. More cost for additional ounce. Marginal cost to produce one more ounce. 
increasing. Why do marginal costs rise? Because marginal productive labor falls. Okay, more and more people to get the same increase in output means you spend more and more. You need piles of people to make that extra bit of pot or the extra donut in your donut shop or whatever it is. You're going to need piles of people and that's going to take piles of money. This picture's here. It doesn't have anything to do with anything, but you know, Modern Times by Charlie Chaplin. Corduroy, still panting down there. Okay, okay. Um, okay, takeaway points. Short run marginal costs rise because of diminishing marginal productivity. Marginal productivity falls because the ratio of variable to other inputs rises. You're running out of stuff with which to work. But in the long run, you don't run out because you can always add more. You can add, make your warehouse bigger. You can add another truck. You can add more machinery. You can add more lighting, whatever it is you need, you can add more of it to go with the extra workers. So your marginal product of labor won't fall. Therefore, your marginal cost won't rise in the long run. Okay, um, so that is it for half, almost half of orthodox economics. Isn't it great? I wish I could convey better how much fun this can be. I'm not saying take it seriously, I'm not saying take the politics, agree with the politics, but it is a beautiful system. And we'll talk more about how wonderful orthodox economics, neoclassical economics can be. And you know, there is something to it. If there wasn't anything to it, then it would not be such a successful uh, intellectual program. Um, and later we'll be talking about markets and Adam Smith. This is great stuff. We're talking about some of the most powerful ideas in Western thought. Um, so, you know, it's easy to dismiss because of the politics and because you know, logical inconsistencies. Um, and it's better not to take it seriously as a political program or else you'll start sounding like Rand Paul or something ridiculous like that. But, uh, but it is a beautiful system. And I hope that you can get a feel for that, how things fit together and it's so cool. Okay, regardless, we'll pick up next time. Bye-bye.